Wow, what a night. Uh, good evening and welcome back to MSNBC's coverage of the Iowa caucuses. I'm Rachel Maddow in New York. It is 10 o'clock on the East Coast. That means it is 9 o'clock in Iowa. And NBC News is still characterizing the caucuses as too close to call tonight. Mitt Romney, Rick Santorum, Ron Paul, all at 23%. Let's check in with our NBC News political director, Chuck Todd, who's keeping an eye on the numbers for us tonight. Well, not only are we characterizing the race as too close to call, but we may not call the race at this point, assuming everything is what it seems to be and how the uh, vote count is being reported in, that we will never be able to call the race before every vote is counted. That's how close it is between first and third. We're seeing in the raw vote, we do know there was a little bit of a, of a slowdown in the vote count by the state party. Remember, it's the state party that's doing these vote counts, but it's important to note NBC News may not ever be able to project this race based on modeling. We'll have to actually do, do it the old-fashioned way, which is wait for every vote to be counted. Now, I know a lot of people have questions about the raw turnout right now. And again, this is uh, based, on, uh, based on some models, but it looks like it's about on par with four years ago. Four years ago, it was about 120,000 Republicans came. So anywhere from about a plus or minus five to 10,000 on each side. And I know that seems like a wide width, but the fact is it would make it either about the same as last time, which was a record turnout, or even if it's a little bit below, it would be the second best turnout uh, of all time. So no definitively huge spike, but no definitive drop off either, Rachel. Chuck, thank you. Uh, let's go back to Des Moines uh, and, and Chris Matthews. Uh, looking specifically at those, uh, those turnout numbers, I think there's a lot of theories, uh, more or less cockamamie, about whether or not high or low turnout is good for any one individual candidate. Uh, but I think that the huge news tonight is that we may not know until mm -hmm. the very, very bitter end of the counting tonight. Chris? You know, uh, Rachel and everybody, and by the way, joining us right now is the chair, chairman of the, of the Democratic National Committee. You know, I'm looking at these results, and you're looking at it from the outside as we are. Uh, it seems like almost a basketball team, a very well-balanced offense here. You've got three people in the 20s. You've got a one or two in the teens. No star. No well, Will Chamberlain on this team. Despite the fact that Mitt Romney has spent the last five years, millions of dollars being right. all in two different races, and 76% uh, of the people who showed up to vote in the caucuses on the Republican side voted for someone else other than him so far. It's uh, pretty, uh, pretty well, disturbing. What do you, what do you make of it? It seems to me campaign. that we know all elections are decided by, by excitement on both sides, of course, and you want to have someone yours, obviously, young people especially, get out and vote. But you know who ends up deciding elections, that very cautious, middle-of-the-roader, right. slightly left, slightly sure. right, who very quietly, they don't give a speech, they go quietly into the voting room, and they vote either for change or the way it is. How do you make the case keep it the way it is with President Obama? How do you argue the case of the status quo? Well, because we've got a president who inherited the biggest set of problems at once of any president since FDR or maybe Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he's spent four, the last three years taking us from a huge precipice of disaster economy to now three straight years uh, of, uh, of private sector job growth, uh, 22 straight months of, of growth in the private sector uh, for jobs, almost three million created. And he's uh, passed the Affordable Care Act, rescued the American automobile industry, passed Wall Street reform. We've, we've pushed through a lot of important changes and stood up for, middle, for the middle class and working families. We need another four years to make sure that we can get the rest of the change accomplished. How does the president shift uh, the attention? Obviously, the voters of this state are not inspired by any candidate to the point that they're spiking. Nobody's there's spiking plenty here. Of anybody there's but no Romney. surge out there right. that we're seeing tonight so far in the numbers. It probably won't show up. So how does the president take what is a personal popularity in the country and convince people that although these have been a tough four years, and they would have been for any president, the next four are going to be better. Because if he doesn't do that, my hunch is he can't win. He's got to sell that the next four are better than this four. Well, doesn't I, he? I I think he needs to sell that he's accomplished a tremendous amount in the face of remarkable set of problems and that there is a lot more opportunity in front of us and that we certainly don't need to go backwards to the Repub failed Republican policies of the past, okay. which their entire field is advocating. Have you noticed tonight and all these weeks we've been watching the Republican fight and all the days I've been out here, I haven't heard the word or the letter W mentioned once? No mention by Republicans of a president who served their party and the country for eight years, fairly recently, 
What's that about? Is that an opportunity for your party? There, there's just uh, no enthusiasm on their side like there should be. I mean, if they are singularly focused on defeating President Obama, which they should be, they should be blowing the doors off this turnout. And to, at best, be matching the turnout from four years ago shows that they've got a lack lackluster field, that they are going to have a hard time mustering the support that their nominee Did needs. Did they have better the candidates than they ran? Um, it, it appears that they have, do not have a field that the Republican, as, as extreme as the Republican base is, they don't have a field that, Jeb, uh, that anyone Mitch can Daniels, get excited about. Chris Christie, people like that, would they have been well, better candidates? Uh, those, the, the better candidates that potentially could have run understand that President Obama is popular, that the American people support him, that he stood up for the middle class and working families, and he's gotten a lot accomplished. And so they know that this is not the, this is not the year for them. You're good. I'm not sure you're right, but you're good. Thank you. U.S. Congresswoman you. Debbie Wasserman Schultz making the best possible case that the best possible Republican <laughs> candidates knew better than to run against President exactly. Obama. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who, of course, Thank chair you. of the Democratic National uh, Committee. I, I, I got to say, can we put up the board one more time that shows not just the first two, th first three candidates, but all of them that we've got tonight? Here's the first three, Rick Santorum, Mitt Romney, Ron Paul, as you see now with 41% uh, in 24-24-22. But now look at the rest here. Newt Gingrich at 13%, Rick Perry at 10%. Rick Perry doing quite a bit better at this early date, with 42% in, than Michelle Bachman. Uh, John Huntsman is somewhere below this margin. Uh, John Huntsman, of course, it should be noted, didn't even really campaign in Iowa at all. The Rick Perry campaign had said, an advisor to the Rick Perry campaign had sort of hinted to the New York Times this week is that if he was looking at fifth or worst, uh, th fifth or worse, he might be going home. So. One of the things that Iowa does is it winnows down the field. It not only picks winners, it picks losers. If Rick Perry does go home tonight, I'm not saying he will, but since the campaign has hinted at it, maybe he will, and I think he likes his job in Texas. If he does go home, who gets his points? Who gets his 10 points? I think initially some of it's going to go to Rick Santorum. Really? It'll go to the wrong? it'll go to the it'll go to the Andy Romney candidate, and then it'll be a question of whether Santorum can sustain the momentum, yeah. whether he can build, whether he can grow, um, and I think he'll have some challenges in that regard. And I think Rick Perry might have something to say about that too. I mean, I, I don't think Rick Perry would endorse Mitt Romney. I think that he would go with the Santorum. Rick Perry, like every other professional politician, will only endorse the person who he thinks is going to win and will wait as long as he possibly can in making that calculation and tr try to do it right before all the rest of the world knows <laughs> that this is the guy who's going to win. Uh, so, uh, you know, and also, I don't think there is such a thing as a Rick Perry follower. I think his endorsement doesn't get you any of those 10%. Yeah. You have to go get those 10% as a candidate. But I think that a substantial amount of those 10% are anti-Romney voters. Sure, yeah. And I think that no matter what Perry would do, many of them, if not most, would go to whoever the strongest anti-Romney candidate is. I can't see people that would go to, to Rick Perry or any of the others because they didn't want to go with Willard turn around and say, okay, we'll go with right, Willard now. Right. I mean, if there is a guy with a pulse, uh, Santorum or any of them, I think that uh, uh, the majority of them would go with them. I will say, though, just my gut check here, it is impossible for me to describe Rick Santorum as the guy with the pulse. Like, Rick Santorum's last electoral competition was, we we're talking about this, may have been the record for the worst loss by an incumbent senator running in a fairly representative state. I mean, as goes Pennsylvania, so goes to the nation, so goes the nation to a certain extent. It's not like he was running in some weird place with weird rules or with weird dynamics. I mean, he got killed in Pennsylvania well, as an incumbent. How can he be the guy with the pulse? It, it was 18 percent. He did win two, twice in the Senate twice. He yeah. was going for a third term and lost. The mood of the country in 2006, we were pretty much sick of what Chris just said, that W guy. And I mean, there was a sea change that was coming. Nancy Pelosi was on the way with the gavel in her hand. I mean, he got wrapped up. There were four Senate seats that went down in 2006 that the Republicans should have won. It was Montana, John Tester. It was McCaskill in Missouri. It was Sherrod Brown in Ohio. And it was, of course, Santorum. So he got kind of caught up in a whirlwind. Uh, not that I'm a conservative in any way stretch of the imagination, but having seen Santorum on the stump, he's as good as President Obama.
I mean, he is a good retail politic guy. He gets in that crowd, and those people are believing what he is saying. He has got a very unique quality, and he connects with people. He's not a bus stop kind of candidate. He gets in their face, answers their question, gets away from the bullet points, and gets very explanatory. There are qualities about him that I think conservatives would really gravitate to. I think to. the idea of Ed Schultz as Rick Santorum surrogate is when, great. Well, he needs if, money to if, if he gets himself. front runner heat, uh, you will not see a candidate who is half as good as Barack Obama was his first time out. And as a senator, he wasn't half as good on the Senate floor. Uh, what, what you have here, Rachel, I think you're absolutely, <laughs> look, what you're saying is, how can Rick Santorum be a nominee? Which is exactly the right question. How can any of them, that every one of these candidacies has some kind of political cancer on it that says, can't possibly, you can't go for the guy who did the individual mandate health care thing in Massachusetts. Right. You can't do it. You, know, you can go right down the line. And so whenever one of them floats up, you're right. We kind of look at it and go, you're kidding me. Rick Santorum. And none of them have a message, Rachel. None of them have come out with any message that will resonate against President Obama. Rick what Perry a good had job a great plan. message, but then he let it go. His well, message was going to be it. jobs, jobs. He forgot it. He forgot. But, <laughs> but uh, what I'm saying is that, that you need someone to, to talk about defeating uh, an incumbent president. I've got to be able to say, this is my plan to America. I mean, they act like Occupy 99%, like that never happened. They're running in an alternate universe. They're not running in the United States of America in 2012. And as long as they keep this horse race going and not deal with the real needs of people, it won't even be a contest. And Rachel, yeah. Rick Santorum answered your question yesterday, and I'm going to try to get this word for word. Rick Santorum said, the best isn't always great, but it's the best. Those, we, we will get his words. It's word for word, something like that. And th he was describing himself. Actually. Wow. There was a it's moment like that in 16 Candles with Anthony yeah. Michael Hall about who he was king of, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right. Because the congressman say we don't fall in love, we, we fall, fall in line. line. That's right. That's Let's go back to, to Chris in Matthews in Des Moines, because, Chris, I know you want to get in on this. Okay, well, let's go back to me in Des Moines. Anyway, I want to bring in uh, David Gregory right now. He's with us, and he's been looking, I believe, at the evangelical vote right now. He is, is of course, moderator of NBC's Meet the Press. David. Chris, we've been talking about this a lot tonight. What are the big narratives? And really, it is Mitt Romney who is setting the tone, how he performs here. What's a big question as we stand here looking at this three-way tie here where we can't even project the winner and won't be able to do it tonight? Uh, can he match his total from 2008 when he lost, when he lost to Mike Huckabee? Look at the internal numbers here when you talk about the evangelical vote. We know in Iowa social conservatives are very important. 60% in 2008 looks like 58% here. Where do they break? Very strongly for Santorum. To a lesser degree, Ron Paul, but significant. But put, put a circle around 14%, only 14% of those uh, born-again Christians, evangelicals, voting for Mitt Romney. Underscores his problem with social conservatives. The upside for Mitt Romney tonight, what's the most important issue for caucus goers? Who can beat President Obama? And there, electability being the issue, that's where Romney performs very, very well. But what was second most important was who's the true conservative? There, again, advantage Santorum, advantage Ron Paul. And we keep talking about Ron Paul. Isn't he really the wild card here? Mike Huckabee, who won four years ago, said he can't be the Republican nominee. So all the twists and turns in this race, Chris, we could have another one if Ron Paul could end up winning this thing tonight. Yeah, I guess the question comes down in each party to at what point in the nominating process do you go from picking the candidate of your heart or your gut to the picking of the candidate who you believe can best win the, the presidential election. There's an old phrase in the Democratic Party, NDC, November doesn't count. Those were the red hots on the left that always wanted to win the intramural fight, not necessarily win the, uh, the presidential election. And I'm wondering on the Republican side, David, if you're any way of looking at these numbers and finding in them where is that break point when people simply say, you know, my guy or my woman can't win. Let me go with the winner who will win in, the, in November. Right. And uh, I'm wondering Look, whether tonight we're not watching something early, early in the season, which is really not about who they're picking for president yet, but about who their heart has. Well, and who about the fact heart. that Mitt Romney, right, and, and the fact that Mitt Romney was before this contest a weak front runner. Will he emerge from this contest still seen as a weak front runner, even if he wins? This will be argued back and forth different ways. Santorum has clearly been successful because he was polling dead last. He's really showed up here. He gets a ticket out, as they say. Ron Paul's the wild yeah. card. 
if Mitt Romney can squeak out a victory here and then go to New Hampshire and win, no Republican's done that. Uh, that clearly helps him. But I, I still think we're in a very volatile period here, to your point about who's got the Republican's heart, who's got their head. We know there's great intensity out there to beat Obama, but there's a, vol a lot of volatility to be left here.